Hey everybody, this video will be on a summary of different models of light in HEC physics. Throughout the module, the nature of light, you would have gone through Newton's corpuscular model of light, Huygens' longitudinal wave model of light, Maxwell's transverse electromagnetic wave model of light, and finally Einstein's quantum model of light. In this video, I will be aiming to summarize each of the models and the related experiments that supports or refutes each of the model of light. A few hundred years ago, Newton proposed his corpuscular model of light, whereby he describes light as consisting of small particles, which he called corpuscles, traveling in straight lines with rectilinear velocity. In contrast, around the same time, Huygens proposed his longitudinal wave model of light, where he contrasted Newton's corpuscular model by stating that light is actually wave in nature, whose longitudinal wavefronts consist of small secondary wavelets that propagate in a semicircular direction as shown by the diagram. The primary wavefront is a result of interference between the semicircular propagation from the secondary wavelets. In Thomas Young's double slit experiment, he shone monochromatic light through two narrow slits separated by a very small distance. In this experiment, the light produced multiple bright bands separated by equal distance on a black background screen right behind the double slit apparatus. This observation made by Young refuted the corpuscular model made by Newton as in this particle nature model of light, only the light corpuscles that travel directly through the two narrow slits will produce a bright spot on the screen behind it. Therefore, if there are only two slits used in the experiment, Young would have only observed the formation of two bright spots. In contrast, in Huygens' wave model, it was able to explain that when secondary wavelets pass through the two narrow slits, they undergo diffraction due to the wave nature, followed by interference between these diffractor waves, resulting in multiple bright spots or maximum points on the screen behind the double slit. He further explained that the maxima are caused by the constructive interference between the wavelets and the dark spots, which are the minima between the maxima, are produced by destructive interference between the wavelets. Thus, Young's double slit experiment refuted Newton's corpuscular model of light, and at the same time, it demonstrated the wave nature of light, therefore supporting Huygens' wave model. It shows that light as wavelets can undergo diffraction and therefore interference, resulting in the diffraction pattern that was observed by Young. In Foucault's experiment, he measured the speed of light traveling in air and water. He did this by using a light source and projecting it through a rotating mirror, which reflected the light to a stationary mirror, and therefore coming back to the rotating mirror. By calculating the angle that elapsed due to the rotation of the mirror between the incident ray and the returning ray of light, Foucault was able to calculate the speed of light not only in air, but water. I discussed more about this experiment in the video on the measurement of light speed. The measurement of speed of light in this experiment supported Huygens' model of light, which predicted that light would in fact travel slower in water, which was shown by Foucault's experiment. The experimental result refuted Newton's corpuscular model because this model predicted that light corpuscles would actually travel faster in water due to a stronger force of attraction between the atoms of water molecules and the light corpuscles. This was contradicted by Foucault's experimental results. In Maxwell's electromagnetism theory, he predicted the existence of electromagnetic waves. He proposed that when you have an oscillating charge, it produces changing electric fields and magnetic fields that are not only perpendicular to one another, but also in phase and self-perpetuating. In simple words, the changing electric field will produce a changing magnetic field, and vice versa, the changing magnetic field will produce a changing electric field. In this electromagnetic wave model, Maxwell proposes that light is a type of transverse electromagnetic wave existing on a whole spectrum with a very specific wavelength. In this wave model, light consists of in-phase, perpendicular electric and magnetic fields that are changing and self-perpetuating, and this could be produced from an oscillating charge. Hertz's experiment directly supported Maxwell's wave model of light, as he used an AC power supply, that is, alternating current, 
which consists of oscillating electrons, to produce a radio wave that is a type of EM wave. The production of a radio wave shows that Maxwell's hypothesis on the link between an oscillating charge and an electromagnetic wave is valid. And consequently, this provides evidence for the electromagnetic model of light. The transverse electromagnetic wave model of light is also supported by the polarization of light. By way of review, a polarizer is a device that decreases the intensity of light and the effect to which it does this depends on the angle between the light's polarizing axis, that is the orientation of its electric field oscillation, and the polarizer's its own transmission axis. The effect can be further characterized by using Malice's law, which is I equals I naught cosine square theta. Theta is the angle which is discussed, and I naught is the initial intensity of light before passing through the polarizer, while I is the final intensity after the light passes through the polarizer. The effect of a polarizer on the intensity of light supports the transverse wave model proposed by Maxwell. This is because in the transverse wave model, the orientation of the electric field determines its polarizing axis. And using this model, we can understand why, depending on the transmission axis of the polarizer, only light of certain polarizing axes can pass through without being filtered by the polarizer. It is useful to remember that polarization of light does not support Huygens wave model because this model proposes that light is longitudinal rather than transverse. Polarization of light is also not supported by the particle or corpuscular model of light proposed by Newton as if light were corpuscles that will pass straight through the polarizer without their intensity being affected like the way they are observed in experiments. Photoelectric effect experiments paved the path to the development of a new model of light that is Einstein's quantum model of light. Previous predictions made by the wave model of light contradicted the experimental observations made by Lennard when he performed the photoelectric effect experiment. The predictions made by the wave models are as follows. Light of any intensity and any frequency should be able to eject electrons. Secondly, the kinetic energy of electrons that are ejected should increase with a greater intensity. In the wave model, intensity is related to the amplitude of the light wave. So therefore, higher amplitude means that the wave has more energy to transfer to the electrons that are being ejected. The third prediction is that the current that is caused by the ejection of electrons increases with greater frequency as well as intensity. I explained all three predictions in more detail in the video on photoelectric experiments and the quantum model of light. As emphasized, the experimental observation in a photoelectric experiment contradicted the three predictions made by the wave model of light. Instead of light of any intensity and frequency ejecting electrons, Lennard found that light below a certain frequency could not eject electrons regardless of how high or how low the intensity of light was. So Lennard demonstrated that the ability of light to eject electrons depended heavily on the frequency. This directly contradicts the first prediction made by the wave model. Lennard also showed that the kinetic energy of the electrons that were ejected increases with greater frequency. This contradicted the prediction made by the wave model as it predicted that the energy of electrons increased with intensity instead. Thirdly, Lennard showed that the current produced by the photoelectrons increases with greater intensity, which partially agreed with the prediction made by the wave model, but it did not demonstrate the dependence of current on the frequency, only on the intensity. The conflict between experimental observation and prediction made by the wave model led to Einstein's quantum model of light. In this model, Einstein describes light as consisting of photons with the energy of a photon given by Planck's constant multiplied by its frequency. Einstein explained that when these photons are instant on a metal surface, they will transfer the energy to the electrons. And this energy transfer only occurs between one photon and one electron. The energy transfer only happens if the photon's energy exceeds the work function of the metal. That is, there's a minimum amount of energy required to remove the electrons 
from the metal surface. If a photon has excess amount of energy, that is anything greater than the work function of the metal, that excess energy is transformed into the electron's kinetic energy. As a result, Einstein proposed that the kinetic energy of a photoelectron is given by the energy of a photon minus the work function of the metal. This equation explains why light below a certain frequency cannot eject electrons regardless of the intensity. If the frequency of the light source is too low, the photon does not have enough energy to overcome the work function of the metal, and therefore an electron cannot be ejected from it. This equation also explains a second observation, because when the frequency of a photon increases, so does its energy. While the work function of the metal will remain constant, increasing the amount of photon's energy will be transformed into extra amounts of kinetic energy. In Einstein's quantum model of light, the light source intensity is related to the number of photons incident on the metal surface. He argued that when there's, he explained that when a higher intensity of light is being used, there will be more photons incident on the metal surface. More photons mean more electrons will receive energy from these photons, therefore giving rise to more photoelectrons. And if there's an increase in the number of photoelectrons being ejected, this will result in a greater charge passing through the circuit in a given amount of time. And that's why the current produced by the photoelectrons will also increase.